I am Karan Bhatia. I am chatting with Manuk Akopian. He is a journalist for the LA Times. You've seen his work on boxing scene. You may have heard him or seen him on Bash Boxing in LA. Manuk, you're everywhere. How are you doing, my man? I'm everywhere and I'm home right now. I'm doing great, Karen. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Uh, really love the work you do and uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And every interview I've done recently, I always have to start off with the same way, which is we know what's going on in the world. Are you safe right now? Everything good on your end? Everything is great. I'm actually very happy that the combat sports calendar is picking back up. That's going to keep us busy for the year, uh, for the rest of the year. So uh, kudos to Top Rank, PBC, Matchroom, and the rest of the promoters for picking up the pieces and, uh, you know, putting the calendar back into action. Credit to Top Rank, Brad Jacobs, and that whole team for what they were able to do. Matchroom now coming back and looks like they have the procedures in place. And then we've heard, of course, about all the other uh, promotions, PBC, Showtime Fox, Golden everybody. Boy. Yeah, Golden Golden Boy, forgot to mention on. Golden Boy, who just had a great show yep. last weekend, too, in California. Absolutely. Virgil Ortiz doing his thing. So there's been a lot of good stuff, a lot of uh, fights coming back. The one good thing that it seems to be about boxing is that it seems that that effort of keeping it safe can be sustained because it's not a team sport with a lot of players in a locker room where things are going to spread. It seems like they've been able to make the bubble mo model work. Um, so let's hope that happens. And I, what I wanted to talk to you about today is something I you know, probably didn't expect to uh, speak to someone about. And that is, of course... Mike Tyson and Roy Jones. Now, we know how great they were in the late 80s, early 90s, and on and on, and these are legends in the game. Everyone knows these fighters, not just in boxing, but in sports, and not even in sports, in pop culture, right? That's, what, that's what's so great about these fighters. But they have announced that they are fighting each other. Um, Tyson at age 54, Roy Jones at age 51. How did this fight even come together? Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure you've been following the tea leaves on the good old internet. I mean, Mike Tyson has been posting all this sparring footage uh, throughout the last couple of months. And usually the headlines write themselves anytime Mike Tyson moves a muscle. So uh, as we've gradually seen, I, I think they did a little bit of a temperature check in the room and they read the room and they noticed that, you know, there's still a lot of intrigue in him and his brand and everything that he does. And um, as we've as we've seen in the last couple of years, Mike Tyson has evolved into a very savvy businessman, whether it's with his cannabis industry, with his hit podcast. I think he's really hitting home runs with the projects that he's been involved with. And he's like, why don't we go back and reflect some old muscles and see whether or not we can actually get back into the ring and actually do this? So, I mean, I think it's it's awesome that they're doing this. However, uh, what they, what we need to let the public know is that this is an exhibition fight in every sense of the word, and they should not be misled in, in, into whether or not this is going to be a competitive matchup as if they would be fighting at the turn of the millennium. And, and that's the important thing, and I wanted to get into the details of what exactly this fight is. It is an exhibition match, um, eight three-minute rounds, eight, eight three-minute rounds, 12-ounce boxing gloves, no headgear, but there's also going to be no judges, um, no fans in attendance, obviously. And if there is a cut or anything like that, right, they're going to stop the fight. Is, is that accurate? Is that how it's going to be? Yeah. I mean, I talked to California State Athletic Commissioner, Executive Director Andy Foster last week, and he pretty much laid out the framework as to how this fight was approved. Uh, he's, he's had a meeting directly with Jones and Tyson and the principals involved in the fight. And it's pretty much been outlined that this is an exhibition in every sense of the word. Now, when he said, if there's a cut and this thing is done, I said, well, what happens if there's a bloody nose? And he, he kind of laughed it off and he said, you know, he's going to let Ray Corona use his best judgment as to what, what the fight is going to be like. However, one poignant quote that Foster told me is that he said, anytime the fight gets heated up, it's going to be Ray Corona's job to pour some ice over it. So you can imagine the competition level and the quality of the, the glorified sparring session, uh, I would imagine it would be that this fight is going to get. Unless, unless Corona goes AWOL as a referee and lets Tyson and Jones do their thing, uh, this is going to be a very tamed environment. And, you know, it's, 
I think it might be a little bit more uh, pleasing to the eye than, let's say, previous high-profile exhibitions have been, whether it's been a Vander Holyfield and a Mint Romney or anything Julio Cesar Chavez does seemingly once a month. So uh, I think it's going to look good on TV, but I just hope the average fan who tunes in or even decides to buy it is not fooled that this is going to be two guys going for each other's head. It's been, it's been stated that it may be a glorified sparring session and scripted entertainment. Um, but at the end of the day, they are fighting. Now, in terms of dollars and cents, uh, the app Triller reportedly has paid $50 million to have this on pay-per-view. It's going to be uh, $49.99 to purchase. And what we're hearing is that uh, both, both fighters will be paid uh, a certain amount. Jones, I think, was to be paid $10 million. Tyson, I'm not sure, but he said he's going to donate his purse to charity. Is that what you've heard in terms of the finances of how it's all going to come together? No, exactly as you laid it out there, Kern. It's specifically laid out where um, – the 50 million is actually reported. It's not something that either camp has come out and said. It was a report that uh, CNN and TMZ have put out there with their sources. So it's going to be interesting to see what this is all about. Uh, Triller is uh, backed by Hollywood executives and um, a a lot of top tier talent in the music industry like Snoop, The Weeknd, uh, Marshmello, and the like. So it's something where it's a very celebrity backed endeavor. Uh, they're supposed to be in competition with TikTok, and I think they want to dive into this celebrity laden world of Mike Tyson and Roy Jones, specifically Mike Tyson. He's clearly the A side here and the one bringing in all the viewers. So it's something that they really want to piggyback on boxing. And in a press release uh, and speaking to the publicists of Team Tyson, they want to partner with Tyson moving forward by hosting boxing events on the platform. So as Tyson has come out and said, this legends only league, it's something that is going to be uh, in the horizon moving forward. So we might be seeing more of this if there is an appetite. So just in terms of Triller's business model, the reason they've decided to put up reportedly $50 million, it will create awareness around this app. Um, people are going to buy this pay-per-view and, and they're hopefully going to recoup their money. Um, but even if they don't, that makes people aware of what, what of their platform. We're talking about it right now. And, and I didn't know about this platform. I doubt you did before we had this conversation, even though there are uh, celebrities and musicians attached to it. Um, but that that's the risk they're taking. They're, they're almost using this as a marketing play, right? Absolutely. And it comes at a very peculiar time because as you know, TikTok is in the headlines daily nowadays with their relations with China and its data sharing. So Chiller might be looking to leverage an opportunity here to see TikTok is on the ropes. Let's go ahead and kind of seize an opportunity for a market share. They reportedly have over 50 million monthly users and 150 million subscriber base. So they're obviously looking to capitalize on that. And with with venture capital money, they're, they're, they're taking a risk. And uh, I, I doubt they would be able to recoup that kind of money f- by paying upfront 50 million, but you know, they might have a different business model on this than any typical boxing promoter or network for, for that matter would. And, and the one thing that they have on their side is, and, and you know, as you work in boxing, I work in boxing, I'm sure that you've had tons of sports fans and friends reach out to you to ask you about what's going on with this fight. And that's not, you know, if Canelo and Triple G three is signed uh, or, you know, Fury Joshua is signed, we're going to have people who know and watch boxing and even some sports fans reach out. But this is this is more in the mainstream, right? This is on TMZ uh you know jimmy kimmel these type of places are going to be talking about this event so that's something that they have on their side the public awareness and the public perception of what this fight is and could be no there's definitely a lot of earned media dollars that are coming off of this that is going to help boxing however if i'm going to go out on a limb i'm going to say this is going to hurt the sport more than it's going to help it because a lot of the casuals who come into the fights for the big Mayweather Pacquiao's, the Mayweather McGregor's, they leave disappointment for the most part because they don't get the blood and guts that they signed up for. This is designed to not be blood and guts from the get-go. 
So anyone who is misinformed by purchasing this, expecting, you know, a 54 year old and a 51 year old to go at it, it's not happening. So I hope there's timid expectations at best and something for them to be, if they're willing to separate themselves with $50 to see more than Mike Tyson sparring footage and training footage, by all means. And just in terms of the fight itself, I, I can't believe I'm asking you about this, but I am. Uh, in terms of the stylistic matchup, we've read Mike Tyson says he's going to he's gonna move forward. He only has one speed. We've actually seen him on social media and things like that getting into shape. For a long time, he was a little bit overweight, and now he's actually in fighting shape. On the other side of the coin, I was at Roy Jones' last fight, last professional fight. That was in February of 2018, so he was in fighting shape. Uh, he won that fight in his hometown of Pensacola. So what do you think stylistically we can expect in this fight? I mean, this is a perfect pie in the sky right now because as we speak, Mike Tyson is smoking mounds of marijuana at his home. He probably, uh, he looks to be in great shape, but you know, he, he smokes a lot of uh, cannabis. Roy Jones, obviously, he should, the public and the boxing media has been calling him to stop fighting for quite a long time now. So he's definitely in a different financial situation to be considering this fight. But as far as how this fight plays out, Mike, when Mike Tyson says, I have one speed, that is true. He's the most volatile and unpredictable fighter we've ever covered and seen over the last three decades. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if Tyson goes crazy and then actually treats this like a professional fight. And if he doesn't stick to the script, this fight could be over in one round in itself because Ray Corona's job is to not let that happen. So it'll, I'm curious as to how it plays out. Um, the fact that there is no judges technically means there's not supposed to be a winner. And unless there's a DQ or miraculously or surprisingly, one of these guys gets knocked out because they punch too hard, then the fight is going to be over. So um, from that standpoint, if I were to pick a winner, I would say Tyson, just because Roy Jones' job is to stick to the script because Mike Tyson's the one running the show. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, go and say Mike Tyson. Well, there you have it. We have Manuka Okupan's official pick for this fight, Mike Tyson. So let me ask you this. Tyson last fought professionally in 2005. Roy Jones, like we said, in 2018. Is there any chance that Tyson coming back into the ring, um, he's just going to be so amped up that referee Ray Corona is going to be trying to separate them and we see something erratic or crazy from Mike Tyson where that's not his MO. He wants to keep... He wants to keep engaging in this fight because maybe he hasn't felt that feeling of being in a, a professional-like boxing ring in a while. Yeah, and I I interviewed Mike Tyson last year, almost to the day. Uh, it was the one year ago yesterday. I went to Tyson Ranch in El Segundo. I talked to him, and this was before, obviously, all this sparring footage and training footage came out. And I was surprised to have him say that he gets – he told me, and I quote him – he gets hives when he walks into boxing gyms, he told me. So I don't know where this miraculous turnaround came to be from, where he suddenly is reinvigorated in the sport. Uh, from, from what I gathered during my meeting that, that morning was that Tyson was not in love with boxing anymore. So apparently he's done some soul searching and being ringside for many of these heavyweight fights, as has been the case over the last year or so, has brought his interest level back. And he's on the cover of Ring Magazine and proudly holding it now. So it's something where I think, you know, as we evolve as people, so has Mike Tyson. And he hasn't had, he's had more second and third and 50 acts than anyone else <laughs> in modern history. So, you know, more power to him if, if that's what he decides to do. But uh, I hope, I just hope it's uh, not a case of let's get ready to mumble at the end of <laughs> Mike Tyson, of course, with the, uh, second or third act, if you want to call it, of kind of in a way going into theater and comedy. He had the one man show. He was featured in The Hangover. That's how a lot of the younger audience, a younger generation, actually knows of him uh, in that way. But everyone remembers Mike Tyson in his prime in terms of the highlight reel knockouts and and what he was able to achieve uh, in the boxing ring in a, in a short period of time. So Tyson is age fifty four. Roy Jones age fifty one. Let me let me ask you this. 
just in terms of fighter safety, I, I've talked a lot about fighter safety and things that need to change in the sport of boxing. Um, and when we know that this isn't a regular boxing match, there's protocols in place. We talked about that. But should they be fighting just in terms of fighter safety? I mean, that's something obviously executive director Andy Foster has to answer just because he sanctioned the fight. He approved it and he approved it without headgear, knowing how unpredictable Mike Tyson might be. But there is some precedence here. Uh, back in 2006, when Mike Tyson was still as, as crazy as ever, he actually engaged in another exhibition fight back when he was in financial dire straits. And he fought heavyweight contender Corey Sanders at the time. Sanders was wearing headgear. Tyson was not. They were fully clothed, even wearing T-shirts. So Tyson knows how, to, how, how this thing goes. He knows the kind of script he has to follow. and Surprisingly, Corey Sanders was not even engaging in that fight. I would imagine Roy Jones would have more pride than that and actually fight back. But as far as not having headgear, uh, that's the most interesting part because you have two of the most recognizable faces in boxing history. And from a marketable standpoint, from a TV viewing standpoint, it's not going to look good when you pay $50 and can't even see their faces. So uh, I think that's going to be a decision Andy Foster is going to have to live with after the fact in case anything happens. Yeah. Andy Foster uh, from the California state athletic commission, he said they're about the same age and they have the right to earn. So it sounds like he's on board in terms of the protocols and the, the way that it's coming together right now. Uh, it's rumored to be on September 12th in Los Angeles. Uh, that's also rumored to be possibly the date for Canelo Alvarez's return. Now you it's, if, Canelo's on the zone. It won't be a pay-per-view, obviously, but um, it, it still could hurt business, I'm sure. How do you see that playing out? Is there a chance that both of these uh, fights and events would be on the same day, or do you think someone's going to have to move off of that date? Um, uh, all I can say is I don't know who has that Canelo Alvarez voodoo doll out there, but he's been pretty cursed over the last year by just the the circumstantial uh, uh elements of things surrounding his fights. Obviously, he's, he missed the September uh, date last year for Mexican Independence Day weekend. And this year with the pandemic and the whole Billy, so Billy Joe Saunders situation, he hasn't been able to get back into the ring. And now this, where you arguably have someone who's going to overshadow your show and Canelo Alvarez is, is in a very curious predicament, not only because of that, but with his business relationship with The Zone and Golden Boy, everyone, it's been reported far and wide that uh, a pay cut is in the picture for Canelo. And I'm pretty sure him being as proud as he is signing boxing's most lucrative contract, it's not going to fly with him to take a pay cut. Imagine Floyd Mayweather being asked to take a pay cut in his heyday. It wasn't even a conversation starter. So uh, I think Canelo is going to have to either or go the date altogether, or pretty much go with what the, the framework has been set at this point. And Canelo controls his own ship. When he makes the decision, we'll find out as much as soon as everyone else does, because um, he is ready to get back into the ring. Just the, the, the financial needs to make some financial sense for him too. Yeah, it's been reported that the way that Canelo's deal is structured with Golden Boy is the zone pays Golden Boy uh, $40 million. 35 of that goes to Canelo. Um, the rest is made up by LiveGate and other things. Now, if you don't have LiveGate, you don't have a lot of that, which can be a big problem. Um, in, terms of, in terms of big money that we talked about, there was a rumor that this fight between Roy Jones and Mike Tyson was actually supposed to come together in 2003, 17 years ago. And Roy Jones said that there was a rumor that he turned down $40 million. He wants to make it clear that he didn't turn down $40 million. And his point of view is that Mike Tyson didn't want to uh, step up to the plate at that point to take the fight. What do you think about the, the matchup back then? Why didn't it happen uh, at an earlier time when these fighters were closer to their prime? You know, uh, one can only one can only uh, assume at this point because I was not covering their careers at that juncture. However, Mike Tyson's pride and ego was at its lowest at that point, following the loss to Lennox Lewis. 
He had been embarrassed twice against Evander Holyfield at that point. I don't know whether or not he was motivated enough or confident in his abilities to, at that point, go against Roy Jones Jr. At that point, his financial struggles had already uh, started to materialize. He surely could have made an even bigger payday fighting Roy Jones. So I don't know why he wouldn't take that fight. However, considering the timeline of Mike Tyson's life, it doesn't surprise me that he was not interested in that fight just because of all of the out of ring distractions he was dealing with. But, you know, Roy Jones would have probably been the favorite going into that fight, considering how his career had been progressing at that point. Absolutely. At that point, of course, it was the upward trajectory, winning the heavyweight title. Um, and we know, of course, what happened uh, after that. But Roy has had the longevity. Like we said, he, he just retired in 2018. And that was that was with a win. Um, the other component about this is you mentioned Mike Tyson and, and his career. Uh, there's been so many people through the years that have had their names attached to a potential Mike Tyson fight. Um, and, and a lot of those don't end up materializing, but it's, it's interesting for us as people who cover this sport to hear his name and just think about what could happen. I think even recently, John Jones from UFC was, was mentioned in that. So uh, Evander Holyfield was another one. And I know that you wrote about this on boxing scene and elsewhere. So what was the Evander Holyfield component in terms of uh, having another, another fight exhibition match with, with Mike Tyson? Yeah, the conversations were there. Uh, Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield, as much as arch rivals they were in the 90s, they have repaired their relationship. They are friends. They they make public appearances together. Uh, they are honored together at events all the time. And the conversation was that uh, Evander would be fighting Mike Tyson. However, for whatever reasons, and Mike Tyson has said this himself too, he said the conversation started from Bob Sapp and they evolved from this person to that person to that person. And Evander Holyfield somehow got lost in the shuffle in between. So it, it goes to show that, you know, no matter how, how much we write about things or how the headlines develop at the end of the day, if it doesn't make business sense and financial sense for everyone, it won't happen. And in this case, for a glorified exhibition, Evander Holyfield was very much interested. Um, as soon as Mike Tyson released that first video that blew social media away, Holyfield, Holyfield released his own training video a few days later. And, you know, that, that was a coincidental timing. That was deliberate, I, I would bet. So the conversation started immediately afterwards. However, it never happened. And Holyfield told me, which is a very valid point, He's like, if Tyson wants to do this again, perhaps with me, everyone is going to judge it by this encounter with Roy Jones. And if they stink up the place, no one is going to take a second look at it. So it's going to be something where we might have a repeat of history where the first exhibition match Tyson had with Sanders in 2006 didn't move the needle from an appetite standpoint. And they canceled that Mike Tyson World Tour altogether. And here, we might have a similar situation where it was fun while it lasted, but we really don't need to be seeing this kind of competition, especially for a specific price. And, and that is the question. What will the event be like? And then what will happen after? You mentioned that uh, Triller, the app, is interested in working with Mike Tyson in the future. Um, I believe he's launched a Legends-only league. And so there is discussions to continue this. It depends on what happens, I think, in this matchup to see, like you said, if it moves the needle. If it does move the needle, um, who do you think Mike Tyson could match up with against in, in future matchups after this fight? Well, a, a lot of the a lot of the old timers are always throwing their name in the hat. You know, James Tony has said he would like to fight. Uh, Lennox Lewis is out there, but I don't see him raising his hand saying, I would like to get into the ring. Uh, Riddick Bowe uh, should not be anywhere near a boxing ring because uh, his physical situation uh, has uh, not been good for the last 15 years. So he shouldn't be taking any more damage to his head. He, I mean, he, he kind of walks with a limp nowadays too uh, when, when you see him uh, at, at boxing shows. So the, the, the crop there for Tyson is not a lot. And I think this is going to be uh, at best a two and done, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's a one and done. Holyfield is, I think, the only other opposition that makes sense at this point. And 
I'm I'm actually surprised how it wasn't Holyfield because if it was if it was supposed to be scripted, Tyson could have exacted his revenge. Holyfield could have bit him back in the ear. It would have been a it would have been a fun fight to see, and we, everyone would have went home happy. Bottom line, it's people and athletes who, like we said, transcend boxing. They, they've made their way into pop culture. Uh, we're always hearing about Mike Tyson and Roy Jones. And so people will be inherently just interested in this. So just to close it out, to put a bow on it, what is your prediction overall about how this event will go? Um, do you think it will strike a chord in, in terms of the public conversation? Will people be interested in this? And, and what's, what's kind of your final thoughts about this matchup? Um, I think there's going to be a lot of interest, a lot of mainstream interest. And as, as the fight inches closer to the actual date, I think people will re- understand, hopefully, what this is from a competition standpoint. As far as it being a commercial success, I'm highly skeptical of that, just because I, I don't see it being that way. Will it get a lot of great social media impressions? Absolutely. Will it get a lot of great retweets? and have people talking about it and have all the influencers back it. No doubt about it. As far as it being a commercial success, I highly doubt it. <laughs> Thanks so much uh, for, for breaking it down, for talking about all the different aspects of this fight. Uh, I've had so many people ask me about this and the fact that we can have all the information in one conversation here. I think it's, it's great for people who are curious about this, who maybe don't tune into our sport. Um, and this is something that kind of piques their interest. Um, so, and I think there are a lot of different moving parts and different aspects to it. So we'll see what comes together. There's still time between now and, uh, September 12th. So we'll see how it all plays out, uh, in terms of an event. Manuk Akopian, thank you so much for uh, your reporting on this event. Thank you so much for the time and thanks for breaking it down. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. And hopefully we get to see them in the ring September 12th. A lot of things can happen in between in the pandemic, as we all know. So hopefully all the cards turn out right. Thanks so much. Thank you.